I just got back uh, a few days ago from uh, several weeks in Greenland. And if you have picked up the recent issue of Rolling Stone, you'll see the story about Dr. Jason Box, who was the leader of the team that I was with. And uh, we were up on the ice sheet several times. We, uh, we had a lot of chance to uh, interact with scientists, interview them, and learn uh, an awful lot about what's going on up there. And had an absolutely stunning, stunning experience that I'm still trying to recover from. And so I'm going to show a few of those home movies here. But I also uh, I, I imagine that there's probably people that have not seen me before, so I want to do a, a fair amount of uh, bringing people up to steam on the basic science of where we are with climate change and, and what, uh, what some of the solutions are. Uh, you're looking at a flyover of the Greenland ice sheet here, and I just wanted to throw this up because uh, just to kind of give some appreciation of what a strange and amazing landscape this is. It's just, uh, it seems like every day in Greenland you see something that just, uh, uh, it, it just pushes your mind over the edge even further. Uh, you're looking at meltwater lakes on the surface of the ice sheet here uh, as we were flying over. And um, I'll talk more and more about what these lakes do and, and uh, what their importance is. But uh, I want to give you just a little bit of uh, background on uh, why we went uh, and what we were doing there. Uh, Greenland is getting darker. The ice sheet's getting darker because uh, more and more areas of snow are melting. And as snow gets warmer, it tends to deform like this. And as it deforms, it reflects less light. So uh, the, the ice sheet becomes darker. And over the last uh, decade, we've been able to measure that by satellite. Dr. Jason Box, my, uh, scientific, our scientific team leader, wrote a paper on this uh, last year where he predicted that if it continues to darken, we would see melting in the summertime over 100% of the ice sheet. And he predicted that would happen within a decade. Well, uh, last year in this place where, where we actually flew into uh, Congar Lusiak, this is what the river look, looked like there. It was uh, overflowing, this bridge was washing out, giant machinery was being swept away because you were seeing melting that was happening over the entire surface of the ice sheet. Um, and uh, so they had never seen this kind of, uh, of water flow there in that river. Uh, it's much less this year, at least so far, but uh, this was a striking, stunning event, and we wanted to get up there and find out uh, why that might be happening. And one of the, uh, one of the questions we wanted to answer was, um, we know there are natural processes that darken ice, but could there be human processes that might be darkening that ice as well. And we know that the acreage being burned wild by wildfires is increasing as the planet gets warmer. And so the question that Dr. Box was asking was, is there more soot from wildfires landing on the ice sheet? And if there is, is that making it darker? Is that increasing the melt? And is that a positive feedback that's going to speed up the melt in the future? So uh, we, he started uh, something called the Dark Snow Project. Uh, we funded it online through crowdsourcing. Uh, I produced several videos to, to uh, sort of our, our uh, fundraising uh, arm of the, the project. And uh, we went up with several scientists. We had Dr. Box. We had one of his colleagues from the Danish Geological Survey. We had Mackenzie Skiles from NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we had uh, uh, videographers like myself. Uh, we had uh, a videographer from Wales, and we had Jeff Goodell from Rolling Stone magazine who joined us for several days, and his article is, is now out on the newsstands. Um, this is some of the dark ice that we went to look at. This is the, our first hop up onto the ice uh, outside of Alulasat on June 25th. And uh, so you can see, surprisingly, you know, there's a lot of areas that are quite white, but then a lot of areas that are quite dark. And here they're kind of negotiating with the pilot to try to decide what our target area is going to be. I haven't had much chance to really edit this video, so this is pretty much close to raw uh, as I shot it. But we we're focusing on this uh, little lake over here. You can see these meltwater lakes uh, popping up across the surface of the ice sheet as the uh, weather gets warmer and warmer. 
We identified this one as our landing zone because we wanted to take a look at this area, uh, this dark area here. We had Marek Steibel, who was our biologist, who wanted to take some samples and look at the microorganisms and critters that are living in there because uh, in that harsh environment, these, uh, these uh, microbes make their own pigments. They uh, uh, create a dark shell around themselves to protect themselves against the intense light. And, the, and the, that dark uh, pigment is, is, in part, what is darkening the ice sheet. And we want to see if uh, pollution from human beings is feeding those uh, creatures and is going to cause uh, more darkening going forward. So this is the first place that we landed to, to take some samples. Uh, but I want to give you a little bit of a background on the issue of climate change in general because uh, a lot of folks uh, are, still have a lot of questions in mind about that. So I'm going to take some time to, to kind of build that over, uh, of where that science has been over the last several decades and uh, bring us up to date. The real science of global warming started during the Cold War, the 1950s. Um, we were paranoid about uh, a nuclear attack from the Russians. We started spending an awful lot of money to uh, prevent such an attack. And one of the things we were spending money on was uh, defensive mechanisms that we could use to shoot down enemy bombers. Uh, and one of the best ideas that we had for how to uh, shoot down these bombers was if we could find missiles that would hone in on the heat signature of those engines. If we could find missiles, if we could build missiles that would be able to find that heat signature, uh, even in the dark and the rain and the clouds, we would have a weapon that would be uh, very useful for defending against a sneak nuclear attack. So we spent a lot of money on this. We built a generation of heat-seeking missiles that allowed the United States to really dominate uh, the air for the last uh, 60, 70 years. And uh, in the course of doing that, we learned about how all the gases in the atmosphere behave, how they absorb light, how they absorb heat at every altitude, at every temperature, at every pressure. And by the time we got through that, we understood that there's some gases out there that absorb and trap heat. Uh, carbon dioxide is one of the most important ones. Uh, Popular Mechanics magazine wrote about this in 1953. The, the products of this research were showing us that uh, if we continue to add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, we're going to see a rise in temperature. This was uh, the work of Dr. Gilbert Plass, who, was, uh, who published a very significant paper on this. This had been uh, an issue that had been kind of kicked around for the previous uh, 100 years or so. But it was this research that really kind of, uh, really kind of nailed it insofar as, as making the science clear. And uh, yet it's taken us this long to really uh, even begin to get through to the public dialogue of how important this is. So we're seeing a temperature rise. This is the NASA temperature graph of uh, going back to 1880 when we feel we have good global coverage with instruments. We can take it back much further. In fact, a very significant paper came out just this past spring, which looked at a number of different uh, temperature proxies, as we call them, like tree rings and corals and uh, stalactites and caves and things like that. And we pushed back the temperature record 11,000 years. And what you've got is this, uh, you've got us coming out of the ice age back here, and then we've got a slow, 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 gradual, gradual decline until the last century. And then this is us here. So uh, we're, we're, we're pretty clear that, that uh, uh, something's changed in the last uh, 200 years, and the only thing that we've been able to track down that really uh, answers it is the, the uh, greenhouse gases that human beings have been putting out. So the question that people typically ask is, how do we know this isn't just some kind of a normal cycle? OK, it's getting warmer, but it's been warmer in the past. It's been colder in the past. Uh, how do we know that this is, this is different from the past? Well, we can measure what's coming into and out of the planet by satellite. And the satellites do a pretty good job of this. We know 
that the planet is in energy imbalance. Um, we know that that energy imbalance uh, uh, is completely consistent with the predictions that have been made about greenhouse gases. And we know that that's quite a big energy imbalance. Uh, it's not small. In fact, it's equal to about 400,000 uh, Hiroshima nuclear bombs exploding every day. That's about four or five every second or so. That's how much energy is being trapped primarily in the oceans because the ocean is the biggest heat sink by far. And uh, so this is an ongoing process. Um, uh, the planet will remain in, in, uh, in imbalance. It will, it will continue to warm until it begins to radiate out the same amount of heat that's coming in. And the big controversy is how warm is it going to have to get before that happens. We know that going back uh, hundreds of thousands of years, there have been a number of glacial periods. We know that 20,000, 50,000 years ago, this theater would have been covered with a mile of ice. And so some people have said, well, maybe, maybe we're in some kind of a period that's like this. It's warming or it's cooling, and, and it's, it's like ice ages we've had in the past. We have a pretty good idea what caused those ice ages. Uh, we know, for instance, that the planet has a number of long-term changes in the way that we circle around the sun and in the way that the Earth turns. Uh, most of you have probably know about this one, that as the earth turns it's sort of like a top and if you put a top on a table it tends to have a wobble in it and the earth has a wobble too and it's called precession and it's about a 22,000 year cycle but there's a couple of others that are important uh, as the earth goes around the sun uh, sometimes the orbit is more circular and sometimes it's more elliptical or edge egg shaped and there are there are two cycles. There's a 100,000 year and a 400,000 year cycle to that. Uh, and there's also uh, yet another one. Yes, uh, the degree of tilt on the axis that we have changes over about 41,000 year cycle from something like 22 degrees to about 24 and a half degrees. And it sounds like not very much. But uh, just to give you an example, if, if this lady were the sun, and if my head were the earth, and I'm tilted a little bit more towards her, then I'm going to melt more on top. But if I'm tilted a little bit more away from her, then I'm going to freeze a little bit more on top. So all of these very, very subtle uh, forces working together over time Every 100 or 150,000 years will take you into and out of an ice age. But these, are, these forces are not what is happening now. First of all, because they happen over tens of thousands of years, not decades or, or a century like what we're observing now. And because the primary forcing from this kind of orbital change that we should be experiencing now is cooling. And as you saw from that graph before, we have been ever so slightly cooling for the last few thousand years. And now suddenly we've seen a, a, a huge uh, uptick in the last 150. We know that it's not the sun that's doing it. This is a, this is a very popular one with a lot of people. Uh, and we know for some of the same reasons. Satellites do a really good job of measuring everything that comes out of the sun. And if we look at those uh, figures over the last 100 years or so, even before we had satellites, we can measure by using uh, various radioisotopes. And scientists will tell you that, yes, uh, the sun did start putting out a little bit more early in the 20th century, but since about 1960, it's been essentially flat. So we know that during the big run-up of temperatures we've seen in the last 30, 40 years, the uh, sun has been flat, or some say even declining. So we're seeing effects, and one of the primary effects that uh, grabs most people's attention is what's happening with the Arctic sea ice, the ice that's floating on the Arctic Ocean. It covers usually most of the Arctic Ocean. Last year, 2012, was the record low, is the lowest uh, Arctic summer ice that we have seen ever since we've been observing it. And uh, this, was, uh, this is kind of a big deal. I'm sorry, I got backwards here. 
because uh, just a few years ago, we assumed it would take much, much longer for that Arctic ice to go away. Uh, you may remember that in 2007, there was a, a big study that came out from this group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they looked at computer models of how rapidly Arctic ice would go away. And as of early 2007, this is what they were telling us, that um, we would see gradual drop in Arctic uh, ice minimum going down to where we probably still have a fair amount of ice left in the year 2100. Worst case, maybe by 2070 we would see open water in, uh, in the Arctic in the summertime. Uh, that very same year, uh, we saw in the actual observations a huge drop in the Arctic ice and that drop has continued so that in 2012 this is now where we are. So we're something like 50 years ahead of the worst case scenarios that a scientists were giving us just five or six years ago with Arctic ice. We're also way, way uh, ahead with the decline of uh, Arctic snow cover uh, in the spring which is uh, going away even faster than the Arctic ice. And all of these things are having an effect. One of the key effects that this has is that when all of these northern areas are covered with white reflective snow and ice, it uh, bounces most of the solar energy off, bounces it back off into space. But when we are seeing more and more open water, dark, soil and dark surfaces, then the solar energy tends to get absorbed. So instead of reflecting 90% of all the energy, you're absorbing 90% of all the energy. So this is what scientists call a positive feedback. And they don't mean that it's good. Uh, it's not a positive thing for us because it's more like a vicious cycle. More heat equals less ice and less ice equals more heat and it just sort of continues on in a spiral and that's what we're seeing in the Arctic and that's why the Arctic is warming at about twice the rate of the rest of the planet. And just to make that point even clearer, I'm going to show you this animation here. This is put together by the National Snow and Ice Data Center and this is a map that starts in 1987. I'm going to make this animation move in just a second. And here you have the Arctic Ocean covered with ice, and it's color-coded. The whitest stuff is more than nine years old. That's very old and very thick ice. Uh, the blue stuff, the dark blue stuff, is one-year ice. It's only been there for one year. It just froze over the winter, and it's going to go away in the summer. Okay, so that's 1987. And we'll start the animation. You can watch the years go by down here and you'll see it freeze and thaw and, and freeze and thaw as we go through the yearly cycle and you'll notice that what's happening here is the thick ice is starting to go away throughout the 90s and as we get up into the 2000s that process begins to accelerate. We're still getting frozen water in the winter times but less and less of it is this old thick ice so we get up into, two, watch 2007, big year here. Boom. And now we get up, this, this will take us up to 2011. So this doesn't even reflect the massive melt year of 2012. And just to give you an example of what's happening just in this uh, past season, this is from March, uh, March and April of 2013 looking at this area above Alaska. Uh, you had a cyclone going on up in this area that was moving, causing some torque on this ice and the ice just started to, to fracture and break up in a manner that was very, very unusual. I talked to scientists at the National Snow and Ice Data Center and they said, what you're seeing here is happening because this ice would have been uh, maybe 20 feet thick 30 years ago, now it's only 3 feet thick and so it's getting pushed around and broken up and much of this did in fact refreeze but it refroze in a manner that was much thinner, much more fragile 
and it is now being uh, uh, pushed around and deformed much more easily and melted much more quickly than it would have been 50 years ago. So that melt season is going on now. Uh, this is the latest graph from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Here's 2012, the record low year. Here's the average uh, of uh, 1981 to 2010, and here's our current year. So we're heading down, getting pretty close to that 2012 uh, low uh, of ice melt. So we're, we're definitely on the path, maybe not for another record year, but for another pretty low uh, year in the Arctic. So about this time, people begin to ask the question, if all that ice is melting up there, how come sea level isn't rising faster? And the reason is because, of course, the ice we've talked about so far is the ice that's floating on the water. And just like ice cubes in your glass, when those ice cubes melt, they don't cause the glass to overflow. You know, the ice and the water just change, just change place and everything stays in equilibrium. This is the ice that scientists are worried about in terms of sea level rise. The ice sheets on Greenland uh, and also in the Antarctic. So you can think of Greenland as like an ice cube one kilometer thick and three times the size of Texas. There's a, the equivalent of 22 feet of sea level rise tied up on the Greenland ice sheet. There's about nine times as much as that tied up in uh, Antarctica. So a small change in the rate at which these things melt can make an awful big difference uh, in the lifetimes, in our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes uh, how much of an impact there's going to be on civilization from sea level rise. And we know that these things are starting to move. Uh, again, 10 years ago, we did not think Greenland and Antarctica were going to uh, change much in the coming century. Now we know that they are actually losing mass. Uh, this is a NASA graph from several years ago uh, using some satellite data that was, that's only been available for the last seven or eight years and uh, we're seeing a gradual loss of Greenland uh, 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 ice. It still snows a lot up on top, but we're losing so much around the edges that the net is that uh, the mass is going down. It's going into the oceans. Same thing is happening in Antarctica. Uh, the effect is small so far, but Greenland's mass loss has doubled over the last decade. And if that pattern of doubling uh, continues over coming decades, then we're going to have to rewrite some of the uh, predictions that we've made about how rapidly this is going to happen. One of the groups, uh, one of the demographics that pays a lot of attention to climate change is military establishments all over the world. Uh, they know very well uh, that this is in the pipeline. This is uh, Admiral David Titley, who is the chief oceanographer of, uh, of the U.S. Navy. He's now retired. Uh, he was giving a talk at the Pentagon uh, to a group of his peers about climate change and about the expectations for sea level rise in the coming century. So I'm just going to let him uh, go into that. And these glaciers are starting to fall apart much faster than anybody even two years ago thought they were going to do this. So this is going to be a huge issue. And potentially, we can see the seas coming up somewhere between three and six feet in the 21st century. Eight inches in the 20th century, three to six feet in the 21st century. So if you've been to Miami Beach, if you've been to Battery Park in New York City or Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco or the harbor in Baltimore and you stand on the edge of the ocean there and you try to imagine three to six feet of sea level rise and then you add on say a storm surge uh, of an extreme event of 10 or 15 or 20 feet, then you understand that we already have a problem. Uh, we've had uh, most of a foot of sea level rise in the last century. We're looking at feet, if not meters, uh, in the coming century. And as extreme events like Hurricane Sandy come, uh, their impact is going to be greatly multiplied by sea level. Now, 
we didn't know a whole lot 30, 40 years ago about how fast ice could melt and what the dynamics of ice melt were. We now know a lot more. And uh, the scientists that I spent time with up in Greenland are developing a much more comprehensive view of how all the processes of ice melt feed into each other. And so I'm going to go through a few of those with you so you can understand why the scientists are concerned that this process could take off much more rapidly than it has been moving up till now. Okay, so here's the meltwater lakes. They're dark, they're blue, they are like solar collectors on top of the ice sheet. So as that ice sheet uh, gets warmer, gets darker, it melts, it collects in these lakes, the lakes collect more heat, they become warmer, the bottom of the lakes becomes softer, that ice and snow melts faster, and what happens, uh, you'll see from this lake, you'll see a little stream coming off. The water is looking for a lower level. It wants to go someplace lower. And these streams, you'll see them all over the surface of the sheet. These are called moulins. And uh, some of them are very wide. Some of them are like rivers. Uh, but we're just going to track this one for a little bit. You can, you can kind of see, you'll get a better look in just a second. You can see the dark stuff that's uh, kind of settling into the bottom of this in uh, little areas. That's the dust and the dirt. Uh, uh, scientists call it cryokinite uh, that we were up there investigating. And, and we think possibly soot uh, is part of that mix as well. Uh, so what you'll see here is this meanders along, it meanders along until it goes down into the ice right there. And as it goes down, it's delivering all that heat down into the deep levels of the ice. So now the heat goes down here, and just like a stick of the butter, the, the, the ice sheet begins to get soft. It begins to move faster, and that water goes down to the bottom, and because it's an incompressible fluid, it will support even a kilometer of ice. It will lubricate even a huge volume of ice and make it move faster over that rocky surface. So that accelerates uh, the process as well. And then once it reaches the ocean, then it, uh, in many cases it'll be at the calving surface of a, of a giant glacier. And this is the Alulisat Glacier. This is the calving front of Alulisat Glacier that we flew along on the first day. Uh, this is the fastest moving ice stream in the world. It's 400 feet high. The water is coming down under the ice and squirting out down here below the water line like a jacuzzi. And it's creating circulation down here and it's drawing warm ocean water in underneath the water line here to, and it makes it accelerate the calving off of the giant glaciers. And this whole bay here is just full of gigantic glaciers. As that movement accelerates, the ice upstream begins to crack and deform like this. And you can see as it cracks, that water begins to collect uh, in those cracks. And that water begins to absorb more heat. And because water is heavier than ice, it actually begins to hydrofracture its way down into the ice sheet, accelerating the movement even further. So what you're, what you're seeing is that at every stage, there is a, a different kind of a process that not only feeds on itself, but feeds into all the other processes in the cycle. Uh, in, in, on the ice sheet, if you want to know what, what's happening, you need to just follow the water and, and see what it's telling you. And this is the story that it's telling us. And this is why scientists uh, are starting to feel that Greenland uh, and, and, and uh, ice sheets across the planet have the capacity to move much faster uh, than what they have uh, in, during, uh, human, during human experience. 14,500 years ago, there was an event as ice sheets were breaking up following the Ice Age where sea level rose 20 meters in 400 years. And uh, that would mean a sea level rise of about a meter every 20 years. So the, the big concern is that we don't tip ourselves into some kind of an event like that where the ice sheets begin to move at a pace 
that is really beyond human capacity to, to keep up with. Uh, just a quick and dirty graph that uh, one of the great Greenland experts, Richard Alley, put together recently. Um, and I won't throw too many graphs at you, so bear with me for just a second here. This is sea level. This is CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay? So we're currently at 400 parts per million for CO2. And if we look back over the historical record, this is not any kind of a computer model, this is just history. If we look back over history, there have been times when CO2 is relatively low and sea level is low. They go in, they go in kind of a lockstep, they go hand in hand. And there have been times when CO2 is relatively high and sea level is high. But if we take a look at the 400 parts per million where we are now, and we just draw a line over to where that should get us in terms of sea level rise, we're looking at, historically, a level of CO2 that gave us about 15 meters more of sea level than what we have now. Now, you don't get that instantaneously. It, 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 it comes into equilibrium over time. And this is sort of a big, dumb way of using a graph. It's not, uh, it's not really, this is not the result of a scientific uh, analysis. But it does suggest that you'd better take a close look at this if you're going to keep raising CO2 levels, because history tells us that when, when that happens, sea level does change. And uh, our challenge would be, uh, would be pretty massive if sea level began to change rapidly. Now, here's a whole different level of challenge. This is new science, and this is uh, one of the hottest topics in meteorology right now. This is the jet stream. You're all familiar with the jet stream. You hear the weatherman talk about it on TV. It is uh, this band of high-level winds that circle around uh, the hemisphere, and they drive our weather from west to east. And uh, the jet stream itself is driven by the temperature difference between the north and the south. So uh, down below the jet stream, you tend to have uh, uh, your warm air, and uh, up above, you tend to have your cool air. And so this is the dividing point between the warm air to the south and the cold air to the north. Now, as there's less ice up here, there's less temperature difference between north and south. And when there's less temperature difference, there's less, uh, less driving power behind that jet stream. So what it tends to do is it tends to meander. It tends to wander around. It tends to get stuck. Okay? It tends to make these big loops that sort of just get, they're called blocks. They just get stuck and they hang and they hang and they hang. So all of you are probably remember uh, the spring of 2012. Uh, I was in Saginaw, Michigan on March 21st of 2012, and it was 88 degrees. I don't know what it was like up here, but uh, you'll remember that we set thousands and thousands of temperature records. And everybody remembers a heat wave in March. Uh, that's not what was, what was unusual about it. What was unusual was that it lasted for weeks. And essentially, it gave us uh, June weather in March. And that was an astounding event. And that was related to the jet stream. This is what was going in, on in March of 2012. The jet stream got stuck. Uh, the eastern United States had this huge bubble of warm air that hung and hung and hung. Meanwhile, over in the western United States, they were having cold air bulge down from the Arctic. They had record snow in places like Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and uh, this was an extreme event. Now, this past spring was almost the mirror image. You all remember this past spring where we were trying to come out of winter and winter would just not go away. And it was exactly this, the opposite situation where we had a big bulge in the jet stream coming down like this cold, wet air hanging over most of the United States. 
even uh, huge, huge snowstorms right up into May in the northern Midwest. And again, it was uh, completely different types of weather, but the same, the same cause. And it would appear if, in fact, this is a product of the change in Arctic ice, that these kind of patterns are going to be with us for the rest of our lifetimes. Uh, this, is, this is not going to go away. And this is the big debate in uh, the meteorological and atmospheric community right now is, uh, is this in fact a product of the Arctic ice? Uh, if it is, we're in for, we're in for a bumpy ride. Uh, that's another uh, snapshot from the spring. Just before I left for Greenland, this huge bubble of uh, warm air settled over uh, Alaska and they were having temperatures, record temperatures in the 90s up in Alaska. Uh, not long after that, uh, a huge uh, uh, dome of warm air ended up over uh, Finland, Lapland, uh, the, the uh, Eastern European Arctic, and they were getting temperatures in the 90s up, up there. So the jet stream becoming more erratic, it just, seems to, uh, it just seems to be continuing. It doesn't seem to be going away, and uh, we're just going to have to begin to get used to it. Uh, just for the record, this is what the jet stream looked like today. I got this off of AccuWeather.com. Uh, it's somewhat north of us, so we've got hot air over much of the country and uh, nothing too unusual uh, for July weather in, in that, but we'll see how long it sticks around. Now, this type of, of jet stream pattern has been responsible for some extreme events in recent years. 2010, you saw uh, gigantic uh, weather anomalies in Russia and in Pakistan that were both probably caused by the same kink in the jet stream. Uh, as this article shows, um, there is a link between events that were happening in Russia and events that were happening in northern Pakistan, linked by the jet stream here. What you saw in Russia was a heat wave that was the worst in a thousand years. It turns out they have really good agricultural records in Russia uh, that go back that far and, is, and uh, after pouring over them, the meteorological uh, service in Russia said they could find no similar event in the last thousand years. So many, many uh, thousands of people died in that uh, heat event and uh, there were massive, massive forest fi fires uh, all over northern Russia that made it almost impossible for people to breathe out on the street in uh, Moscow. At the same time, uh, Pakistan was having record rains that caused about a quarter of the, the population of the country to have to be evacuated, a uh, massive impact on their agricultural system. And this represents one of my biggest concerns for climate change uh, in, the, in the relatively near term. And that is, we're going to see extreme events like this impacting upon developing nations. And 50 years ago, 40 years ago, we could, we could watch these things on the news, and we could shake our heads, and we could, we could uh, thank our lucky stars that we were uh, living in a developed country. We could maybe send 10 bucks to the Red Cross, and we could put it out of our minds. Uh, that's no longer the case. These people are nuclear armed now. And an unstable government made even more unstable by disastrous weather events is a problem for all of us. It is a problem globally. And coming out of this event with uh, such agricultural losses that Russia had, Russia is one of the world's great grain exporters. They had to stop exporting grain in 2010. Uh, Argentina had problems. Australia had problems, all weather related, uh, related to uh, gigantic extremes. So as a result, 2010, 2011, food prices spiked all across the planet. Food rioting began across northern Africa in the Middle East. 
out of those food riots in Tunisia, uh, a shopkeeper finally went out onto the street and set himself on fire, and you had a revolution touched off in Tunisia that touched off revolutions all the way across the Middle East. This we call the Arab Spring. Okay? Climate change did not make those unstable despotic regimes, but climate change created the conditions where they became even more unstable and political dominoes began to fall. And now the United States is getting drawn into one of those conflicts in Syria, which looks like it's heading to become another Af Afghanistan, except an Afghanistan with weapons of mass destruction, massive stores of poison gas. So through this kind of domino effect, climate change can have unexpected, unpredictable, and potentially catastrophic impacts uh, on all of us. So uh, that, that is a, uh, uh, the kind of concern that intelligence services and military services are looking at and taking very, very seriously. Um, extremes right here in the United States. This is a graph made by the Texas uh, uh, chief climate scientist, John Nielsen Gaiman. This is in the summer of 2011. They had a, an enormous heat and drought event in the U.S. Southwest, particularly Texas, Oklahoma. And so he went back through June through August, uh, rainfall and temperatures uh, as far back as he could go in their records. And each little dot uh, represents a year. And so you've got rainfall here for June, July, August, and you've got temperatures here. So 2007, pretty wet, not very warm. 1952, kind of dry, kind of warm. 1934, very warm, very dry, dust bowl, right? There's 2011. So that is an extreme event. That is what statisticians call an outlier. That is what we're going to see more and more of under climate change. That might be the kind of thing that is caused by these changes in the jet stream that we're observing. So you get, get not just a week of hot weather or two weeks of hot weather, you get a month or six weeks of hot, dry weather, and then you end up with something like that. So this is with us now, it's happening now. It's not for future generations, it's not for 100 years from now. We're in it. We're in it now. So. That is some of the bad news, but there is good news. And I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think there was good reason to uh, uh, let people know that we can turn this around. There's a lot of good things happening. We have solutions. Uh, we are uh, implementing renewable energy, non-fossil fuel energy. This is the most important thing that we have to do. Uh, we are learning how to use less energy to do the things that we need to get done. Uh, wind is a big story across the world, but also here in Michigan. This is uh, one of the first big wind farms uh, down in the Thumb. And wind energy in Michigan is actually quite a success story. The Public Service Commission uh, recently put out some numbers of how wind energy was doing here in the state of Michigan. Three years ago, the cost of wind energy was 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, 5 cents. In just three years, it's come down by half. There's a lot of reasons for this. We're getting much better at how we do this. Uh, but a year or so ago, I spent an afternoon uh, with a gentleman in Eaton Rapids, who is a manufacturer of the giant hubs that hold those uh, blades on wind turbines. And because he was deeply embedded in the advanced manufacturing culture here in the state of Michigan, uh, he felt that he could do this process better than anybody else was doing it. And he developed a, a whole new machine, a whole new process for, for uh, uh, machining these giant uh, wind turbine hubs. And he's taken these huge pieces of metal, which formerly took 36 hours to machine, and now he can do it in six hours. 
and he says, we're only going to get better. And he's also working on a number of other innovations in the wind sector that, that will make uh, wind turbines costs go down even further. And the Department of Energy also agrees this cost is going to continue to go down. And in fact, uh, Bloomberg News, not exactly a radical publication, uh, talked about some of these facts. The nuclear industry is taking a terrible beating uh, from wind. Wind power boom has benefited consumers in regions where wind development is fastest, contributing to a 40% wholesale power price plunge since 2008. Uh, so based on all this good news, uh, wind is exploding around the country. We're also seeing solar. These are manufactured right down the road here in Midland. They're solar shingles. Sun hits them. Electrons move around. You're generating a current. And the Wall Street Journal, no less, pointed out just a few months ago that utilities now realize they're facing a mortal threat from solar energy. Solar energy is coming on so fast that it is going to change the way electric utilities do business. They will have to change or they will die. Um, Fox News has noticed, and that's why you're going to see, and you have been seeing, a tremendous uh, disinformation campaign on Fox News and the usual talk radio outlets who are uh, trying to uh, push back against renewable energy because their, their clients, their, uh, uh, they are speaking for the, the big fossil fuel uh, uh, energy companies. And I just want you to watch this one. This is particularly telling. Um, uh, this uh, young journalist here was uh, on Fox and Friends in the morning and she was talking about why solar energy seemed to, to be doing so well in Germany, which is not the narrative that Fox News wants you to hear. Yeah, okay, Germany has lots more sun than we do. That's the Fox News, that's the Fox News line. That's why they're doing so well. Okay, little geography lesson here. Uh, Germany is a small, cloudy, northern European country on the same latitude as Labrador, Canada. Okay, uh, this is the solar resource in the United States. Uh, red and yellow is more. Uh, blue and purple is less. Here's Germany. Uh, there is no place in the United States that gets less sun than Germany. In fact, Alaska gets more sun than Germany. Okay? But just to give you a, a picture of how rapidly Germany is moving down this road, about a year ago on a sunny day, a sunny Saturday in May, Germany produced half half of its electricity from photovoltaic solar cells on rooftops. That's how fast they are moving down this road. Now they don't do that every day, we don't expect them to, but it tells you how rapidly that very modern, very competitive, highly industrial economy of 80 plus million people is doing and, and how far ahead of us they are and how much work we've got to do, despite what Fox News may tell you. But get ready for that. You're going to hear more and more of it. As, as solar continues to build up uh, like wind, you're going to hear more and more of this kind of disinformation. Uh, this is the cost curve for photovoltaic solar over the last 30 years or so. And statisticians, statisticians and scientists will always caution you when you look at a, cra a graph uh, to not imagine that you see a trend where maybe none exists. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there is a trend in this graph. Solar is getting cheaper. And it's continuing to get cheaper. And the cost of conventional power is staying about the same. And somewhere out there in the future, and in some places this has already happened, those lines cross. And you can argue about whether it's two years or five years or ten years. But those lines cross and solar energy becomes cheaper and it begins to peel away major customers from utilities and utilities start to go into a death spiral if they haven't figured out how to compete. 
So Reuters wrote this up not long ago. Uh, renewables are ready to turn utilities into dinosaurs of the energy world. You saw the, the headline from the Wall Street Journal about uh, uh, the mortal threat to utilities. Uh, we have to get our utilities to change. We have to get our regulators to change. We have to get the attention of our legislators and let them know that climate change or no climate change, the technology is coming that will require that we produce and distribute electricity different than we have over the last hundred years. It is going to be as profound as the impact of the internet uh, on communications. And the companies that aren't ready for it are going to go away. Now, one of, the big, uh, one of the big arguments that you hear against renewable energy is, what do you do when the sun doesn't shine? What do you do when the wind doesn't blow? Uh, as a matter of fact, that's always been a problem for utilities. They've always had to deal with that because sometimes coal plants break, sometimes nuclear plants have to be refueled, and what are you going to do? This is the uh, Ludington pump storage power plant you can think of it as one of the world's largest batteries. What it's supposed to do is that when uh, your power plant is running at 3 o'clock on Sunday morning and nobody needs the electricity, you, instead of turning off your power plant, you use that electricity to pump water up into this artificial lake. And that stays there until some time when you need it, like maybe on a hot day like this when everybody's turning on their air conditioner. You open up the gates, water runs down, it's just like a dam, it's generating electricity, and then you can have, uh, you could potentially back up wind or solar energy 24-7 uh, using this technology. So this is, this is off-the-shelf technology. New technology constantly coming online. Uh, just yesterday, article in uh, uh, the New York Times talked about new battery storage technologies cheap enough that they are now competitive uh, with natural gas uh, for backing up wind and solar. So uh, we're, we're turning a corner on that, and that is, uh, that is happening rapidly. And just in case you think that the pump storage power plant is some kind of a toy, it's about the size of the Hoover, Hoover Dam. And it's not a science project. It's not a boutique item. It's uh, industrial grade. Now these are young people who are training to be wind energy technicians at uh, Columbia Gorge Community College in Oregon. And uh, they're people that are definitely getting, getting in on the jobs of the future here. Now, not everybody's going to want this job. I get that. Um, most people in this field are going to get jobs designing and building and selling and transporting all of the stuff that goes in here, um, which looks like this. And so when I talk to people in the Detroit area in Michigan, I look at this and I say, OK, big metal things that turn. Is that something we could do here in Michigan? Generally, I get pretty good agreement on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Department of Energy agrees, too. Michigan is one of the states that could benefit most, uh, uh, especially from uh, 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 dedicated policy on more wind in this country. We're looking at something north of 30,000 jobs, uh, good manufacturing jobs that can't be outsourced. And um, how far above 30,000 sort of depends on what kind of policies we put in place. Right now, we've got a legislature that's somewhat behind uh, the rest of the country, to put it kindly. Um, and they need to hear from us about this. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to just cut it off there. Uh, there's lots more to say. And I could stay here all night and show you pictures of Greenland. But I was hoping that there might be some question and answer that we could do. Uh, it's, it's really hot out there, so it's nice and cool in here, so I'm happy to just stick around and uh, answer any questions anybody might have. And uh, thanks, thank you uh, for all coming out. <laughs>